Raman's microscopy. So just to give you an idea of what I'll be talking about today, um, first I'll go through some motivation as to why we're interested in using our nanoprobes for uh, cancer diagnostics. Then I'll move into maybe some background information on surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy, as well as the design considerations uh, for nanoprobes used in transcutaneous detection. And finally, I'll, I'll present some results on our uh, on our, our, our on the competing physics of SIRS enhancement and extinction. So a typical clinical workflow uh, for a cancer patient involves some sort of screening whether that's uh, imaging or some sort of localization of a tumor, biopsy, diagnosis, therapy, and follow-up. If we focus on the, the biopsy portion of the workflow, uh, what typically happens is the physician will identify a tumor or a mass in a patient, and of course then some sort of biopsy needle will be inserted into that mass, and a core of tissue will be extracted. Once that tissue is extracted, um, what happens is a pathologist is going to take it, fix it, and then perform some sort of sectioning. And typically, the, the gold standard currently in cancer diagnosis is performing some sort of H and E staining, which would be then evaluated by that pathologist um, and then graded, and you would follow up the patient and tell him or her whether they have cancer. So the goal of our research is really to look for optical or vibrational spectroscopic techniques that could be used as alternatives to immunohistochemistry. So in terms of the research that I work on, uh, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to tailor different nanoprobes with um, distinct chemical and targeting mechanisms, apply them to different types of tissue assays where we can determine the different uh, frequency and expression of various biomarkers, and then apply them in a way that we can quantify and get back to the patient as to whether or not he or she may actually have cancer, just like a pathologist would do by examining a, an age and age stain. So this really involves a lot of uh, iterative design in terms of uh, our nanoprobes. We have to consider things such as the modality, how we're going to detect our nanoprobes, what kind of surface chemistry we want, we want to have on, their, on them, what kind of size and shape, whether they should be endocytosed or if we just want to put them on tissue sections, as well as what kind of targeting mechanism we want to use, whether we want to use angiogenesis, if we're doing in vivo measurements, or maybe antibody or aptamer-based mechanisms for targeting. So really the, the encompassing goal of our research is to use surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy as our sensing modality. And that, as I'll be discussing throughout this talk, has a variety of benefits when you compare it to um, other common label-based techniques such as fluorescent dyes or quantum dots. So um, just to give you some background information on, on Raman spectroscopy, typically what happens when you shine light onto a molecule is that it elastically scatters. So the energy of the scattered photon is equivalent to the energy of the incident photon. And that's called Rayleigh scattering. In Raman scattering, typically the, the energy of the scattered photon loses in it, is lost. Um, so typically, uh, the, when you shine light onto this molecule, it'll vibrate in some way. And once that, and once that molecule vibrates, it's going to lose energy, and we can build up a spectra based on how, how the different modes are built. So one of the nice things about Raman spectroscopy is that we have chemical specificity, meaning that if we have different chemical structures, we can easily determine, uh, we can easily uh, distinguish between them. So for example, what you see here is fluorescein and uh, methylene blue. And they both, have, as you can see, they both have very distinct chemical structures as well as Raman spectra. And the real benefit of having this chemical specificity is that we have the ability to multiplex our different analytes. So for example, if we had 5, 10, 15 different biomarkers that we wanted to look at, we could attach different labels to them, different analytes, and then we could easily multiplex and demultiplex 
uh, the signal if, if, for example, the tissue had up to 15 different uh, biomarkers. The real disadvantage of having um, of Raman spectroscopy is that the sensitivity is very poor. Um, if you compare Raman to fluorescence, what you'll actually see in some cases, fluorescence has a 14 orders of magnitude stronger signal. So that's really where nanotechnology comes into play, where we want to be able to improve the sensitivity of Raman. So really the solution is to use metallic nanoparticles. So we've known for hundreds of years that metallic nanoparticles have interesting optical properties. Um, what you see here is a, a chapel in Paris that actually has gold and silver nanoparticles embedded into its glass. And that's a result of different optical uh, uh, constants that these metals have. So for example, if you have gold nanospheres, uh, they absorb strongly, they absorb green light very strongly, so they appear red. What we want to be able to do or what we, how we would be able to exploit the fact that these nanoparticles have interesting optical properties is use the fact that they have a localized surface plasma resonance. So basically, these nanoparticles, when you shine light onto them, they're going to have electrons on their surface, which collectively oscillate. And then as a result, depending on the size, shape, and metal, whether you're using silver or gold, it's going to strongly absorb light at a specific wavelength. So in the case of these spheres, whereas they appear very red, they're going to strongly absorb green light around 530 nanometers. In addition to having this localized surface plasma resonance, there's an evanescent electromagnetic field that's generated due to the oscillation of these electric electrons. And that's really where we're able to uh, what we're able to use in order to increase the Raman sensitivity. So by placing molecules near the surface of these nanoparticles, we can increase the sensitivity of, of our analytes such that we can meet or beat the sensitivity of fluorescence in some cases, depending on our configuration and our, the metal we use. So not only do we have nanoprobes that are chemically specific, we also have nanoprobes that are highly sensitive, such that we can use them in tissue-based measurements. <clears throat> One of the additional benefits of using uh, nanoprobes is that we have the ability to optically tune them. Uh, so for example, gold nanorods have two plasma resonances. The first is called the transverse mode, which is a result of the plasma resonance along the short axis. It's typically very small. We don't re usually try to tune it. But the longitudinal mode, which is the second one here, is very strong. And we can tune the longitudinal mode by increasing the aspect ratio of the nanorod. And by doing so, we have the flexibility to optically tune the absorbance of our nanoprobe solutions such that we can uh, investigate various optical properties. So as you can see here, when you tune the aspect ratio, you kind of get all these nice colors, which actually is just indicating to you how the absorbance changes as the length increases. So the question we've asked in our research is what can we do or how can we design these nanoprobes such that we can optimize them for tissue-based measurements? And really the considerations that we have to think about are um, we want to be able to propagate through light. And a more difficult consideration is we have, to consi we have to realize that nanoprobes scatter and absorb light, and we want to be able to measure some sort of SIRS enhancement. So typically, when you suspend these nanoparticles into a solution, the, the light is going to extinct, meaning that there's going to be scattering and absorption. But there's also going to be nanoprobe to nanoprobe optical interactions. And that can actually decrease the, the realizable signal that we measure at the detector. So to address the first concern, or the first consideration, we just use near-infrared light. And that helps us propagate 
light through tissue as deeply as possible. And the reason behind that is because you know, tissue generally absorbs light less in, in the so-called optical window, which is in the near infrared. So all of our measurements are performed at 785 nanometers. To address the second consideration, which is more difficult, um, we have to combine Beer's law, which basically says that as light propagates through some sort of path length, it's going to exponentially decay with SIRS enhancement. And SIRS enhancement, um, in a very general sense, can be described as the electric field to the fourth power. Um, and by combining these two different processes, we can kind of predict what the, what the expected or what the realizable signal is. So to, to perform this study, what we do is we, we use a, a cuvette rather than doing this directly in tissue. We use a one centimeter path length cuvette. And that helps us really just study the optical um, nanoprobe to nanoprobe interactions. So if we model um, the extinction enhancement for a five nanometer gold sphere, we see that there's significant overlap. And actually, this is actually how we started this project. We found that when you use a green laser to excite something like a five nanometer sphere, you don't get any Raman signal at all. And the reason is because the extinction dominates the enhancement, the SERS enhancement. So to further study this, what we did is we made a library of six different aspect ratios of gold nanorods. And we wanted to have them blue and red shifted from the excitation wavelength of 785 nanometers. So what we did to um, perform our Raman measurements is that we, we wrapped them in some sort of polyelectrolyte and then we attached electrostatically our molecule, which in this case was methylene blue. And that just helps us reproducibly uh, synthesize and fabricate these particles. And it also helps prevent any sort of aggregation, which is really nice because aggregation in SIRS can lead to uh, very unreproducible results. So what we did is we quantified our our results at the 1616 wave number band. And we found that by normalizing our spectra to concentration and analyte molecules using mass spec, um, we found that our, our aspect ratios here can significantly, uh, can significantly affect the measurable signal. So using, uh, so actually we found the aspect ratios 2.5 to 2.75 had the highest signal. And that's very surprising because typically um, you would want to excite at the plasmon resonance if you were to, say, dry these nanorods onto a quartz substrate. You would get the best signal at the plasmon resonance. But in this case, we have the greatest enhancement from the blue shifted aspect ratios who shifted from the excitation wavelength. And that really has to do with the, uh, with the um, extinction that we see in our one centimeter path length cubettes. So in addition to looking at uh, how nanoprobe to nanoprobe op interactions can occur, uh, we wanted to look at what kind of shape dependence there is for su suspension-based measurements. So what we did is we synthesized uh, three different shapes of nanoprobes, uh, cubes, spheres, and trisoctahedra. And we wanted to ensure that they had similar optical properties. So basically what you see here is that their absorbances are essentially identical. And of course, this is also excited at 785 nanometers. So it's very far off resonance. And this way, we can really just look at the, the interaction of the shape or the curvature rather than trying to look at extinction as well. So what we did, first of all, is just take these nanoparticles and model them in 
finite element method. So basically we use console multiphysics. And you can see that there's a concentration of the optical field at, uh, at the sharper corners. And what this is actually called, this has been known for, this has been known for many, many years. But what this is called is, it's called the lightning rod effect of Cirrus, where sharper geometries or sharper corners can result in higher electromagnetic fields at those edges. So what we did is we did this in triplicate. And basically what we did is build, build a calibration curve based on methylene blue, which is our analyte of interest. And we found that spheres have the porous signal whereas trisoctahedra and cubes have relatively large signals. And this is, the, um, this is the Raman spectra of our different shapes. And you can see that cubes indeed have the largest signal. Um, and we attribute this fact to the lightning rod effect. Uh, and this is actually very important, for example, if we, we were able to uh, if we wanted to um, disperse this in tissue, ideally what would happen is we, we, would, uh, we would generate or synthesize nanoparticles with the sharpest corners to obtain the maximum signal. So in conclusion, uh, for our off-resonant excitation, when designing nanoprobes, we have to consider, um, uh, we have to consider extinction as well as enhancement. Uh, for our shape dependence, we have to consider ensemble measurements of, of nanoprobes with minimal aggregates, and we can show that uh, the lightning rod effect um, uh, results in the highest enhancement for particles with sharp corners. So I guess there's a variety of people I'd like to thank, um, especially the MCNTC for uh, funding this research, um, as well as everyone in our group and uh, the various collaborators that we have. So if there's any questions. I'm not sure exactly. It's like some people claim like tens of millimeters, uh, but they use different techniques. Um, it, it's it's not super far. It'd be have to be a transcutaneous measurement. You wouldn't be able to get like internal organs or anything like that. But yeah.